From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So the last class we were talking about basic uh, interference, two-beam interference. And let's start out here just by writing down the, uh, the basic equation that we're working with. We said that th if we have two beams, uh, one of a radiance I1 and the second one of a radiance I2, that when we combine these two beams, assuming they're coherent, in the next chapter we'll talk about what we mean by coherent, but right now let's say they're coherent. So the resulting irradiance is given by the sum of the irradiance of the two beams plus two times square root of I1, I2, times the dot product of the unit vectors for the uh, direction of polarization of the two beams uh, times cosine of alpha. And remember, alpha was the, uh, is the phase difference between the two interfering beams. And the form of alpha just gives us the shape of the fringes. And we'd started out first just by looking at um, two plane waves interfering. And for that, we found that the fringes were going to be straight and, and equally spaced. I want to start out today by talking a little bit about this A1 dot A2. We, uh, often neglect that or assume that a1 dot a2 is equal to, to 1 but the question is what happens uh, in real life and so let's I'll go to one of the view graphs and you probably don't have uh, the view graph with you but it's easy enough that we can just uh, sketch this okay so we're saying we have these two beams coming in here interfering one beam coming in at some angle theta 1 and the second beam is coming in here. For this case, I took theta 2 to be going all the way around here. But it's coming in at this angle right here, theta 2. And we're taking the electric fields, and we're breaking it up into two components. We have the S component, which is perpendicular to the plane of incidence, or perpendicular to the paper here. And so we have E sub S for the one beam and E sub S for the other beam. And then we have the P component here, uh, which is in the plane of, of incidence. Uh, this E sub P here for one beam and E sub P down here for the other beam. And sometimes kind of to remember which one is S and which one is P, we kind of think of this as kind of like a skipping thing. So it's S. Well, P is kind of plunges in to the, the plane here. So we call that the P. Anyway, we have these two beams interfering. Now, what we note down here, what we would see is certainly the dependence of the A1 dot A2 as a function of angle here uh, is different for the S and the P polarizations. If we look at the S component, well, A1 dot A2 is always parallel, independent of angle. While for the P component, that's not true. For the P component, the A1 dot A2 will depend upon the angle between the two interfering beams. And in fact, if we were so unfortunate as to try to interfere beams at an angle of 90 degrees, the P component for the two beams would be at 90 degrees, and the A1 dot A2 would be equal to zero we would not see interference. So I guess this is, is saying one thing, that if we, if we want to interfere beams at uh, large angles uh, between the two beams, we probably should try to have a polarization to be S and not P. Otherwise, we're going to reduce the, uh, the uh, contrast of the fringes. OK, any questions on that? Okay, let's go on here and, and look at these fringes that we had uh, 
started to look at last week, or last class, I guess I should say. And let's now, for simplicity, since we've kind of discussed this, let's say that let uh, um, a1 dot a2 be equal to 1. Not going to worry about it. And so now we would have that i is i1 plus i2 plus 2 square root of i1 i2. How many dreamed about this equation last night? Well, by the middle of the semester you will. Um, times the cosine of the phase difference between the two interfering beams. And if we go back to last lecture where we had these two plane waves and we went to the plane where x was equal to 0, we had the nice result that ky times uh, uh, sine theta 1 minus sine theta 2. Okay. So that's our, our equation for the uh, interference of these two plane waves. And if we were to make a plot of this, of the irradiance, as a function of uh, y here. And we have, let's see, we have some average value. That will be i1 plus i2. And then the maximum value here will be what? i1 plus i2 plus 2 times the square root of i1. And the smallest value down here is going to be i1 plus i2 minus 2 times the square root of i1, i2. And what this will go to 0 only if, i write it over here, go to 0 only if, um, what can we say about i1 and i2 to make this go to 0? Only if I1 is equal to I2. So we're going to have some fringes here that look like this. Yeah, should be nice sine waves. Hmm, that's a terrible looking sine wave. But anyway, you get the idea. And um, the spacing here, we already said that last class, but the spacing will be determined by when this goes through, what, 2 pi. And so that is going to be equal to lambda divided by sine 1, sine theta 1 minus sine theta 2. So that would be the spacing. What we want to do now is to define fringe contrast or fringe visibility, what we'll call it. So fringe contrast or fringe visibility. And so I'll just call that V, or maybe I'll call it C. But what it's going to be is the maximum irradiance so I max minus I min over I max <coughs> plus I min. Okay. And so that is equal to, we go to our equations, which is kind of disappeared off the top here. But that's going to be equal to well, I max was I1 plus I2 plus 2 times the square root of I1, I2. I min was the same, except it was minus 2 times the square root of I1, I2. So the difference here would be 4 square root of I1, I2. And down in the basement, when we add the 2, one is, has a plus 2 and the other is minus 2, so we just get 2 times I1 plus I2. Or we can write this as 2 square root of I1, I2, over I1 plus I2. And 
And um, another way of writing this is let me just define this quantity here. Let's say that this distance right here, so this is how much it varies about the average. Let me call that the AC. So the AC here is 2 square root of I1, I2. And let me call this thing down here the DC. So the DC is the average value, I1 plus I2. And so we could come back here and rewrite that as simply AC over DC. Okay. And I guess the last thing I might do here is that what this is going to be equal to 1 when I1 is equal to I2. Okay. And I'm just going to rewrite our expression here that if I1 is equal to I2, then the irradiance would be 2 I1, 1 plus cosine um, KY sine theta 1 minus sine theta 2. And if I1 is equal to I2, then we can go to a trig identity that I think we used once before. That we're going to get a 2 out here in front. So it'll be 2 times 2 of 4, I1. And then this is going to be a cosine squared of 1 half KY sine theta 1 minus sine theta 2. So you these are cosine fringes, or you can think of them as cosine squared fringes. We have a one half inside here. <clears throat> okay, so we've we've gone through the the interference of two plane waves, and we got nice straight interference fringes. And what I wanted to do here was, that fortunately, I remembered to bring with me today a couple of plane waves. And so I want to look at the interference of these two plane. Waves. Find one here. Here's one plane wave right here. And maybe we need to zoom in a little bit on this because the wavelength is uh, too small. And so, I mean, I think of this as a plane wave. Maybe I hope I can convince you that it's a plane wave. That, you know, this wave is maybe traveling along here to the right. And uh, I think those of you who took Gaskell's course realize that light always travels from left to right. Is that right? So we have light going here from left to right. And um, I'm going to freeze it in time and look at it. And so these lines here, well, the distance between the lines would be one wavelength. Okay. And I brought along with me a second plane wave of the same wavelength. Here. And so what we're going to do is to superimpose these two plane waves. Here's one plane wave, and here's a second plane wave. And when I superimpose these two plane waves, I will see that at some locations in space, the two plane waves are in phase, and I get a bright interference fringe. And at other locations in space, these two plane waves good thing, are out of phase, and the bright lines on one fall on the uh, dark lines on the other one, and I get a, a dark fringe. Okay, So these would be like my interference fringes. And we said that if we change the angle between the two plane waves, if the angle becomes larger, the fringes are going to get closer together. Ah, and they do. Okay. So nice and straight, and as they you know, increase the angle, they get closer together. Decrease the angle, they get further apart. And if I'm careful enough, I can get one, essentially one uh, fringe. It may be a maybe a bright fringe, or it may be a dark fringe, depending on you know, depending on that phi one minus phi two that I kind of forgot about. All that does is shift the position of the fringe. 
So can I convince you this is like interfering of uh, two plane waves? Because so I also has a land I'd like to sell. But uh, I think this is pretty good representation representation of interference of two plane waves. Okay, so we're all experts now on interfering plane waves. So we have to go on and look at something else. And so the next thing will be to look at interfering two spherical waves. So let's do that. Okay, so let's, that's good. So this is section 4.2. Two spherical waves. And um, so let's say we have two point sources here. S1. Another point source here. S2. And um, these guys come over here. And we're going to look at the interference here at some point P function of r. And so one of these distances we will call r minus r1, and the other one would be r minus r2. And so we could write here two electric fields. One is uh, some unit vector a1, which we'll soon not worry about. And we have some amplitude b1. It's a spherical wave, so the amplitude drop off is one over the distance, so one minus uh, one over r minus r one, and it has some phase, and the phase will go as e to the i k to pi over lambda times the magnitude of r minus r one, so two pi over lambda times whatever this distance is, minus omega t plus phi 1. So that's the first spherical wave. And the second one is going to be the same here, except uh, replace the 1s with the 2s. minus same frequency and some phase <coughs> phi 2. So we're going to interfere these two spherical waves and, and see what shape fringes we get. And um, just to make life simple for me, we'll say let uh, the square root of I1 be equal to B1 over R minus R1. And we're going to assume here that we're far enough away that over the observation plane here, um, this is approximately equal to a constant. So I can do that for the amplitude, but I can't do that for the phase here because I have a 2 pi over lambda, and lambda is a very small number. And so a little, little changes in r, r minus r1, will cause that to uh, vary too much but I can do it in the amplitude. And we'll do the same thing for I2. So I'll, I'll write it down here. So I2, well, square root of I2 is B2 divided by R minus R2. Um, and that essentially is a constant. So now we can write down here, we want to find the shape of the fringes. And remember, the only thing that we have to worry about for the shape of the fringes is alpha. What is alpha equal to? Well, alpha is just the difference between the two faces. And so it's k, I'll write down as 2 pi over lambda, times, we have r minus r1 minus r minus r2. The omega t's cancel, and we get a phi 1 minus phi 2. Okay. Well, 
Well, all we're saying here is, I don't, the origin is someplace. I don't know where. I don't care. All I care is what this distance is. And so that distance will be r minus uh, from r1 associated with it. So I wrote it in general, so I don't have to worry about it. Anyway, this is just the distance from the point source to the observation point for one wave and for the other wave. Now, for a given fringe, this is going to be equal to a constant. And we said that for a bright fringe, that's equal to 2 pi times some integer. For a dark fringe, it's 2 pi times an integer plus a half. And so what we're saying here, so these are this, that's just a constant here. So what we're saying is that the difference between these two distances is equal to a constant for a given fringe. And if you go back and think, what type of curve does that describe? Can anyone remember from your geometry days? The difference in these distances is equal to a constant, so let's say, well, I won't repeat that because it's wrong. <laughs> it's a hyperbola. Okay. So these are hyperbolic. So whenever we interfere with two spherical waves, we get hyperbolic fringes. Now, again, being a little lazy, let's say let phi 1 minus phi 2 be equal to 0. And if phi 1 minus phi 2 are not equal to 0, how do the fringes change? They just shift. The shape will not change. The fringes will only, will only shift a little bit. And so, um, that's fine, then I can just, I can set that equal to zero. So now what we're saying is that we have these, we have these uh, hyperbolic fringes, and what I want to do now is, is kind of study these a little bit more. Uh, kind of interesting things that are going to happen. So let's um, put that up here, and let's make a little drawing. Let's look at the fringe pattern. And so we'll just say, well, we have some x, y <coughs> coordinate system here. And we have these two points, two point sources, one there and one down here. And this is up a distance c, and this is down a distance c. Okay. And so Right over here, 2C is a point separation. And we're going to get these hyperbolic fringes, and I'll just sketch in my interpretation of hyperbola. Something like that. And so we would have the one distance here, would be the r minus r1. And the second distance down here, given some to some point there, is the r minus r2. And so we could write down here, this is x, y, and then z. Um, we could write down that r minus r1 is equal to the square root of y minus c, we're up there at distance c, squared, plus x squared plus z squared. And we could write down that r minus r2 is what y 
plus c squared plus x squared plus z squared. Now, I'm going to get tired of writing r minus r1. So I'm just going to call that r1 prime, and I'll call that r2 prime. So I can make my writing a little bit easier. Now what we're going to do is to look at a fringe surface. Um, defined by, well, the difference between these two, um, R1 prime minus R2 prime, I'm going to say that's equal to 2A, whatever A is, 2A. And for a bright fringe, right fringe, uh, 2A is integer number of wavelengths, and dark fringe, two A is M plus half number of wavelengths. So what we're going to do now is just four or five lines of little algebra here playing with these equations to, uh, to get the equation for the nice equation for the fringes. And so first thing I can write here, um, so we have a R1 prime minus R2 prime is 2A. So I could write here that R1 prime squared, supposed to be a prime now, R1 prime squared is equal to R2 prime squared plus 4A squared plus 4A R2 prime. So I just solved this for R1 prime and squared it. And then I rewrite that as R1 prime squared minus r2 prime squared minus 4a squared is 4a r2 prime. Then I take this and um, square it again. And so we will get that r1 prime squared minus r2 prime squared quantity squared plus 16a to the fourth minus 8a squared r1 prime squared minus r2 prime squared is 16a squared r2 prime squared might wonder why I did that, but just have faith it will work out here. Then I rewrite that as R1 prime squared minus R2 prime squared squared plus 16A to the fourth minus 8a squared, so r1 prime squared, and we bring that over here, and then we'll have a plus r2 prime squared. It's equal to zero. Three more lines will be there. What we have to do now is we go back here and we look at these definitions we had for r1 prime and r2 prime. 
so we can then write that r1 prime squared minus r2 prime squared is equal to minus 4yc squared. Okay, that'll take a sip of coffee. And then we still have a plus 16 a to the fourth. And now we're going to square these things out from our equations, and this will become minus 16a squared times x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus c squared. All that's equal to zero. Getting close. And um, so now we'll do a little factoring. And we take a y squared times a c squared minus an a squared plus an a squared times an a squared minus a c squared minus a squared times x squared plus z squared. All that's equal to zero. And we now have the answer we want. We'll write down the answer that we want. We have, we can divide through here and get y squared over a squared minus x squared plus z squared over c squared minus a squared is equal to 1. And that's actually what we were trying to get. Because this is the equation of a hyperboloid revolution if a squared is less than c squared. So let's write that down. So everyone buy that okay? Give you a second to finish writing it down. So we got the the equation for the hyperboloid and uh, now it's kind of interesting to look, we're going to look at it in a little more detail here. Let's first look along the y-axis. So we're going to come back here and just look along this axis. And um, what we would have here is that y squared is equal to a squared if a squared is less than c squared. And this means what a squared less than c squared means we are between the points. Between uh, two points, two sources. Okay. So if we're in this region right here, then we have the result here that y squared is equal to a squared. And otherwise, um, if we're outside of these two points but along this axis, what's the path difference between the two? R1 prime minus R2 prime, if I'm right up here, is equal to what? Well, one path would be from here to here, and the other one is from here to here, and the difference is always 2C. So otherwise, um, R1 prime minus R2 prime is equal to 2C. Okay. 
So it's not very exciting outside here. It's a constant wherever we are. But as we move along in here, it changes. Because um, we <coughs> have it that a squared is equal to whatever y squared is equal to. And so we could write here that alpha, which is the difference for the two, is 2 pi over lambda. So if we're between the two points, we have alpha is 2 pi over lambda times plus or minus 2y, which was, I mean, that was our 2a. And this is equal to m times 2 pi for a bright fringe. And so delta y, the fringe spacing, is equal to, to go from one fringe to the next, this will change by 2 pi, and so y would change by, delta y would change by spacing the fringes. To make this, to make this change by 2 pi, how much does y have to change by? Half a wavelength, lambda over 2. So if we go back here, we say outside of the two points, just looking along the y-axis, not looking anyplace else, along the y-axis, outside the two points, it's just a constant here, um, depending on what 2c is equal to. Inside here, we have a series of hyperboloids going along here, where the separation from one fringe to the next fringe is half a wavelength. And so, I mean, we, we saw this before, early part of the, uh, of the uh, classes, where we said we had two waves going in exactly the opposite direction. And we had these nodes that were separated by half a wave. And so here, we have these fringes separated by half a wave. And that's the closest the fringes can get. It's when the beams go in exactly the opposite direction, and then the separation is always half a wavelength. Okay. So what I what I want to do now is again I'm going I brought along a couple of spherical waves with me someplace here if I can find them, and I want to look at the interference of these two spherical waves, and I want to show you first that we get hyperbolic fringes here. Okay, ready for that? So let me see if I can find my two spherical waves here someplace. Uh, here's one. Okay, for some reason I brought three. Okay, here's one spherical wave. Let's see what it looks like. Ooh. Oh, okay. Good. So that's one spherical wave. And so here's, makes me dizzy just looking at it. But here we, we have a point source in the center. And so this guy is expanding outward. And I've kind of frozen it in time. And so these little circles here are separated by a wavelength again. Okay. So you buy that for one spherical wave. Well, not only do I have three, I actually have four spherical waves. I have a lot of them here. Four, five. I'm finding them all over the place. Okay, five of them. So that's one spherical wave. And then this is the other one I'm going to use right there. And so it's um, the same wavelength. So what we're going to do is we will superimpose these two spherical waves. And what's the shape of fringes we're going to get? Hyperbolic. Now, I have to confess I'm a little nervous right now because I've done this before with students who are not nearly as smart as you people. And they have not been able to see that these fringes are hyperbolic. But I'm assuming that you people are much smarter and that you want to pass the course. And so what's the shape of the fringes you're going to see? Circles. Now you're going to see hyperbolic fringes. And we'll stay here all day until you do. Okay. So here we'll take one spherical wave, and here's the other spherical wave. 
And if I look at the shape of these fringes here, the shape of these fringes is, ah, A for the man in the first row here. They're hyperbolic fringes. That's right. They are hyperbolic fringes. Some people looked at them and said, I don't know, they're straight fringes, or I don't know. I've had a lot of crazy answers over the years. But well, these are hyperbolic fringes. And I will. Yeah, that's a little press. Very small rate. They come down here, and they zip around here real fast. And if you go way out on hyperbola, they look pretty straight. And so that's why previous students have been confused. But I'm sure no one here. And so, of course, as you put the point sources closer together, you get, you get fringes that are more widely spaced and so on. Okay, so I made it through there. Everyone saw hyperbolic fringes, right? I was kind of nervous about that today. Okay, well, there's more that we can learn about these fringes. Let's go back here. What I'm going to do is to come back here to our drawing, and I guess we need to zoom back down. I'm going to celebrate the coffee. You know, this coffee you buy out in front here, it's really good. I don't know if anyone's bought it or not, but uh, it's super coffee. I also was thinking that if I promote him enough here on TV, maybe he'll give me a discount and I buy it next time. Anyway, we have um, these two point sources, and we kind of looked at these fringes, and they were nice hyperbolic fringes. What I want to do now is to come out here along the x-axis, some distance x naught, and look at the fringes out here in some some plane. So I'll just go out here, distance x naught, and we're going to look at the fringes in this plane here. And I'm going to make sure, that unlike my drawing, <coughs> this distance x naught is going to be large compared to the separation of the point sources. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, so let's look out here. So, observation plane. Along x-axis at x is equal to x naught. And so we go back to our equations here, and we plug in x is equal to x naught. We solve for y. Then we're going to get y is plus or minus a over square root of c squared minus a squared times the square root of c squared minus a squared plus x naught squared plus z squared. Okay. And this is exact. There's no no approximations. So when you hear that, you probably are assuming the next thing we're going to do is to make an approximation, which is close to the truth. I'll just rewrite this first. I could rewrite that as plus or minus a square root of 1 plus x naught squared plus z squared over c squared minus a squared. So this is exact. Now what we're going to do is we will, we will make some approximations. First, we're going to have a small field. And so we're going to assume that C is much, much greater than A. So if I came back here, you know, if I go, I draw a line perpendicular here, my x-axis, which is just in between the two point sources. If I go right on axis, what's the path difference right on axis? Well, it's going to be zero. The two paths are matched right there. And as I move off axis, 
how much will the path difference change until I move off to the next fringe? A wavelength, okay? Move off to the second fringe, now the path difference is two wavelengths. So A would be, uh, or 2A would be two wavelengths. And so I'm going to stay here only in a small region where the path difference is much smaller than this distance right here. That's what I'm saying there. Now, the next thing we're going to say is that x naught much, much greater than z. And so um, we're going to say that uh, uh, wherever I'm at right here, this distance is long to distances out of the paper. Okay. And then the last thing we'll say is that we have a small source or separation. Two C compared with distance X naught. So we're saying that unlike my drawing, this distance here, the case we're looking at this distance is much larger than this distance. Okay. <clears throat> So if that's true, then I'm going to come up here and make some approximations. And plugging this in, we would have that y is approximately equal to plus or minus a. So we're looking at this equation right here. So it's plus or minus a times x naught over c. Okay, so we've just said that we can we can neglect all these other terms and just end up with square root of x naught squared over c squared, and so that's x naught over over um, c. And so we have that y here is plus or minus m lambda x naught. Um, over 2c, or we have m lambda is y times 2c over x naught. Okay. So what what's the shape of the fringes we're getting now? This is just the equation of straight lines. And so the fringes are straight lines, and they're equally spaced. Okay, And so it's really the same as what we got before when we interfered two plane waves. And the two plane waves, then, you can think of as being at angles plus or minus theta, where theta is, goes to C over x naught. So when we came out here, we said we were out here far away, looking at a small region here. And we have these two spherical waves interfering. But the fringes we get here are just the same as if we had two plane waves interfering, you know, one coming at this angle and the other one coming at this angle, angle being C over X naught, plus or minus C over X naught. Okay? Any questions? Well, I'd like to... To get to this point, we went through quite a number of equations. I'd like to do it again 
um, a little more simply and just kind of think physically what is happening here. And so let's repeat this last derivation uh, in a little more simple manner. So again, we're looking only at fringes out here in this region, not any place else, but in a small region uh, close to the x-axis here. We want to look at the fringes. And so and we have these two sources here. And they're separated by 2C. And we're looking at the fringes here at some point. One of these guys is R minus R1. And the other one is R minus R2 away. And so we get a bright fringe. when um, R minus R1 minus R minus R2 is M lambda. And so we said that R minus R1 is equal to square root of Y squared minus 2cy plus c squared plus x naught squared plus z squared. And oops. And we'll write that. We'll factor out of all these quantities, the biggest quantity is x naught. We're far away. So we'll factor out x naught. And so it's x naught times 1 plus y squared minus 2cy plus c squared plus z squared over x naught squared. So this is exact for large x naught. This is approximately equal to, and we're going to use the binomial expansion. And one thing you'll learn in this course is that I love the binomial expansion. I use it all the time. And so this will be x naught times 1 plus y squared minus 2cy plus c squared plus z squared over 2x naught squared. And we're saying that x naught is large enough I can throw away the other terms. So that's r minus r1. We could go through a very similar thing for r minus r2. And the only thing that's going to be difference here is that C moves on the other side of the x-axis. So this minus 2C would become a plus 2C. And so the result here is that this will be approximately equal to x naught times 1 plus y squared plus 2CY plus C squared plus Z squared over 2x naught squared. And then, very simply here, for a bright fringe, uh, m lambda is equal to the difference of these two. And when we do the difference, everything subtracts out except what has changed sign here. And so we get x naught times 2cy over x naught squared or y times 2c over x naught. Okay. And so physically, I mean physically what is happening here is that we come over here and we do have two spherical waves interfering. And we do get hyperbolic fringes. However, we are far enough away here that the basic curvature of the two spherical waves will be the same. It's going to cancel out. And so these hyperbolic fringes then will become straight line fringes. And it's going to be just like interfering two planets. Now, that's true only in a small field. If I extend the size of my field, 
I mean, the answer is they're always hyperbolic, but uh, in a small field here, they're going to be very close to being straight Euclid spheres. Well, I brought along, as I showed you, I brought along some spherical waves, but I brought along some that do what? Mm -hmm. So m lambda um, you just want to see the last page. m lambda is x naught two c y over x naught x naught squared, which is y over y times two c over x naught. So it's just like interfering two plane waves. Now, what I want to do is to look at some moiré patterns to look at this interference. And so what we're going to do here is to go out here and look at what the phase looks like in this plane right here. And so we wrote down, well, we wrote down the expression here for the path difference. And if we were to plot that, we would find out that the path difference out here due to one spherical wave looks like this. So this center here would be along here where the point source is, okay? And then as we move, look out here, looking at the path difference, so I go out here, it looks, just plotting the last curve makes it look like this. So that is looking at the phase of the spherical wave out here, a one spherical wave. And now if we look at the phase or path difference of the other spherical wave up here, it's going to be the same, except it's going to be shifted in the y direction. So now if I look at the moiré between these two, what I should get here should be essentially straight line fringes. Now can you believe I can take a pattern like this pattern like this and superimpose them and get straight line fringes? Well, let's hope. So they're off-centered a little bit. And I think the fringes are pretty straight here. Of course, as we put them closer together, fringes get more widely spaced. And if I put them right on top of one another, I get one fringe. That's where the two point sources are superimposed. Now we change the separation between the two. And the fringes get closer and closer together. But it is basically straight lines. Okay. That kind of worked. Kind of nice. Happy. Okay. So that was looking at the fringes out here. Now we have one more example we want to look at for spherical waves. And the example we want to look at here is that we want to go up here some distance now and look at the fringes in a plane perpendicular to the y-axis. And first off, we know that if we go up here, right on, on axis, the path difference doesn't depend, as, doesn't change as we move this back and forth. But as we move off axis, probably some interesting things will happen. So going up here. So the observation plane is perpendicular to the y-axis. And it's at some point where y is equal to y naught, which is just some constant. And the only thing is it's a constant. It's going to be outside of the two-point sources. So it's up here someplace. So now we go back to our basic equations, and we would have that um, we could rewrite it that x squared plus z squared is equal to y naught squared over a squared minus 1 times uh, c squared minus a squared. Back to our basic equations for the difference between the two paths. And I will rewrite this. Well, I'll say we'll define r. As the square root of x squared plus z squared. And that will be equal to 
c squared minus a squared over a squared square root square root y naught squared minus a squared. And you know there are no approximations here. This is uh, exact. And um, so x and z, um, so x is here and z is in and out of the paper. And so this is a, what, these are circles, concentric circles. That's what we're going to get for fringes. And I, I mean, I didn't even need to go through any math to see that. If we look up here someplace, some plane here, just because of symmetry, you know that these fringes have to be circles. Okay. And so this is the radius of the circles. And um, so now we will make an approximation here. And um, we'll say if, why not? Could be positive or negative, but the magnitude of y naught is much, much greater than the magnitude of a. Remember, 2a was a path difference. Then we could play with this and find that the radius here goes as the square root of c squared minus a squared over a squared. And now we can just kind of neglect that a squared in here, so this times y naught. So the radii of these circles will be proportional to y naught. It's proportional, I'll write that down and we'll look at the drawing. So if we go out here, we get circles here. And the radii of these circles is proportional to how far we go. So it's sort of like, you know, we have cones, sort of. I mean, they're hyperbolic fringes, but it's almost, as we get way out here, they're straight. And so, sort of like we have cones here, and the radii of these fringes then will be t directly proportional to how far away we go. Okay. But there's still a little more. Note that I, before I go on here, I haven't talked about basketball at all today. And maybe you understand I'm a little nervous about tonight, so we won't. We may not ever talk about it again, I don't know. Anyway, going on here, so we have these circular fringes, and I might as well bring out and show you what they look like. They have the same pattern that I showed you before for a... Um, before it was path difference. but So we get these circular fringes. I mean, they're, they're sinusoidal, or cosinusoidal, not binary like I have here. But they're going to be um, uh, sinusoidal, looking something like this. Let's go on and look at them in a little more detail, and then we'll come back to that drawing. So what I can write, <coughs> excuse me, what I could write here is that the path difference 2a for a given fringe uh, 2a is equal to, um, well, I shouldn't say for a given fringe. The path difference 2a here is equal to 2c. Remember, 2c was the path difference on axis. Say, I'll write on axis OPD. So the path difference at any point is equal to whatever the path difference was on axis plus something. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to write it as minus q times lambda, where q is some number. I don't know what it is. Um, but any point out here then, any point out here, uh, 2a is equal to whatever it was on axis plus or actually minus something amount, some amount, q lambda we'll call that. And um, 
So Q is simply the order number change from the y-axis. Okay. And so I can rewrite this that R, just go up to this equation here, R is approximately equal to C minus A times C plus A, so that would give me my C squared minus A squared, over A squared times Y naught. And C minus A, from right here, C minus A is equal to Q lambda over 2, whatever Q is, some number. And C plus A, well, that's almost equal to 2A. Q isn't going to change. I mean, this number here isn't going to be very large compared to the other numbers here. And so I could write this then as a square root of Q lambda over C times Y naught. And so these fringes that we're getting here are concentric circles and they're going to go as the, the radius here will go as a square root of this order number Q. Okay. And so these fringes here will, you know, concentric circles and the radius of the given fringe will go as a square root of that order number. Still a little more to see here. We have a few minutes left. The question is, let me, let me define, well, I'm going to look at the fringe spacing. And let's say that delta R is a fringe spacing. OK? Distance between two fringes, two consecutive fringes. And I'm going to define something called the spatial frequency. as 1 over delta R. And the question, I, what I'm trying to solve here now, is how does the spatial frequency change with radius? How does spatial frequency change with radius? So if I go back here and look at these fringes, and as, as I move out, and I define a spatial frequency as 1 over the fringe spacing, how does that spatial frequency depend upon the radius here? Well, let's go through a couple of equations here. And simply from above, we had, we had this expression here for the radius. So I'm going to square that, write that r squared is Q lambda over C times Y naught squared. And I'll just say, well, 2R delta R is equal to, well, going from one fringe to the next fringe. If I let delta R be the distance going from one fringe to the next fringe, Q will change by 1 going from one fringe to the next fringe. So this is simply Y naught squared over C times the wavelength lambda. Okay. Now, I can solve then for 1 over delta R, which is what we call the spatial frequency. And that then will simply be equal to 2 C over y naught squared r over lambda. Okay. 
And so the interesting result here is that there's a linear relationship between spatial frequency and radius. So we'll say, therefore, spatial frequency increases in a linear fashion with radius. So let's go back here and look. I mean, what we were what we were looking at here is that we have well, my messy drawing. We have these two point sources. We're coming up here to a plane that's perpendicular to the y-axis. We're looking at the fringes in this plane. First off, the two interfering beams are parallel to one another, right in the middle. And so we move out here from a little bit, there will be a small angle change between the two interfering beams. And the farther we move out here, the larger the angle between the two beams. So in the center, fringes are parallel, and then they get a little angle between them. So in the center, the fringes are going to be widely spaced. As we move out from the center, the fringes are going to get closer together because the angle between the two interfering beams becomes larger. And so that's exactly what we see. In the center, now again, these would be sinusoidal instead of binary like I showed here, but in the center, you know, the two beams are nearly parallel, so the fringes are widely spaced. We move out from the center, the angle between the two beams will increase, so the fringes get closer together. And we have found here that the radius of a given fringe goes as the square root of the order number difference between that fringe and the center here. So it goes the square root of the order number. The next thing we determined was that as we moved out from the center, the frequency, the spatial frequency of the fringes, one over the spacing, the spatial frequency of the, of the fringes increases in a linear fashion with radius. Now in interference, you're going to see this type of interference pattern many times. And you always have this, you know, square root of the order number is a radius, it, uh, is proportional to, the uh, radius is proportional to the square root of the order number. And you get that the spatial frequency is, increases in a linear fashion with radius. Um, kind, of a, kind of a neat little fringe pattern we get here. Well, what we're going to do next class is we've, we've looked at the interference of two plane waves. We now, and then we looked at the interference of two spherical waves. Of course, now what I have to do is look at the interference of a plane wave and a spherical wave. And then we're going to look at the interference of a plane wave and a cylinder wave. And these two, it will not take too much time to, to look at this. Then we'll go on and talk about coherence. So I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>